Hello, welcome back. This is lesson four, part one of sixth grade oceans and atmosphere and climate unit. I'm excited for today's lesson because we're going to try to answer the question of how the ocean might affect what's happening in Christchurch during El Nino years. So today's title is called The Ocean in Motion. To help you be really successful with today's lesson, you're going to need to gather the following things. You'll need a notebook and a pen or just some paper to write on. And it really helps to have someone to talk to. The science that we're going to be doing in this lesson requires some deep thinking. And having someone to bounce your ideas off of just makes your thinking grow a little bit deeper. And I'll be here to help you with that as much as I can. But having someone else there to talk to makes it so much better. Okay, so let's get started. One of the things that we learned in the last lesson was about how the word latitude means the distance from the equator. So if you are far from the equator, you have a high latitude, and that would be what it is up in the North Pole or down in the South Pole, very far away from the equator. The equator is represented by this black line that's going down the middle of the earth. And in this picture, you can see that the colors are kind of changing. And this is showing over the course of a year, the temperature that you might see in different parts of the planet. The map that we looked at in lesson three was static, which is just a word that means it stayed still. So I found this graphic because I thought you might find it's interesting that at some times of the year, the temperature might be warmer or might be colder. One of the things that you learned as a student climatologist is that the, the distance that a location is from the equator, the more energy it gets from the sun. So a location that's very close to the equator is going to get a lot more energy than a location that's further away. The thing that we are trying to understand is how come the, the location isn't changing, but the temperature is. So Christchurch air temperature and ocean surface temperature both become cooler during El Nino years. But we, we know that the city's latitude is not changing. So what else might affect the location's air temperature? We can see from this graph that we looked at during our last lesson that the amount of energy that Christchurch, New Zealand is getting during an El Nino year and a normal year is the same. So this is the investigation question that we're going to try to understand today, which is that other than latitude, what else affects ocean surface temperature? So to do this, we're going to read an article called The Ocean in Motion. And this is an article that Kitty Parada from the New Zealand Farm Council set, sent to us just to help us understand a little bit more about oceans. Um, from the title, I see that it's called The Ocean in Motion, so I'm interested in that. Okay, let's take a look at this picture that's at the top of the article in just a little bit more detail. If we look at this picture here, it looks like people are picking up shoes from the beach. I think that um, I see a lot of shoes on this beach. I don't know if I've ever been to a beach that had quite so many shoes on it. But um, it looks like they were in the ocean. Um, why would they be in the ocean in the first place? That's something that I wonder about. And how did they get to the shore? The title of the article is called The Ocean in Motion, so that kind of makes me think that the explanation for these shoes um, might be somehow connected with the movement or motion that's happening inside the ocean. I've noticed when I go to the beach that the water comes in and sort of like hits the shore and it seems like it's moving around, so maybe that's something to do with it. So there's two different ways that you can get the article. The first thing you could do is you could go on to your Amplify Science account and then go from, go to the menu, choose the library, and then choose the Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate unit. And then once you have that, choose the article, The Ocean in Motion. Another way that you can get a copy of this article is by going to this website, seattleschools.org slash academics slash curriculum slash science. So if you want to pause the video to write that down, you can get the article from there. Once you are on this page, scroll down until you get to middle school, and then you can download the lesson four packet from the Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate Unit. So I'm going to go ahead and read part of the article, and um, then you can open up the article either from the packet or 
from Amplify Science and read it on your own. But let's read the first paragraph together before we do that. Okay, I've opened the article and here it is. You can see the same picture we just looked at. The caption of this picture says, thousands of shoes fell off the ship that was carrying them across the ocean. Oh, that's how they got in there. Fell off a ship. Okay, eventually some of those shoes washed up on this beach. People collected them and tried to find matched pairs. Free shoes! There's so many. I wonder how that looks like a pair right there. Right there. Okay, let's keep reading. Surprising things sometimes wash up on shore, and this can happen all over the world. During a powerful storm in 1990, containers packed with 61,000 shoes fell off a cargo ship traveling across the Pacific Ocean and eventually washed up on beaches in Oregon, Hawaii, and Japan. Okay, let me pause there for just a minute. When I read that the shoes washed up on beaches in Oregon, Hawaii, and Japan, the first question I thought of is how? Okay, but I want to dig a little bit more deeply and not just say how, but instead say, how could three locations so far away all end up with shoes from the same ship? That's really, that's a little bit mind blowing almost. Okay, let's read the next paragraph, or the next part of the paragraph. These locations are hundreds or thousands of miles away from the place where the shoes were spilled. How did the shoes make their way to those, to these locations? One of the things, one of the things that scientists do as they read is they take notes to try to understand what they're reading. And Kitty Parada has sent this article to us because she believes that the information in this is going to help us answer the question about El Nino and how it affects the air temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand. So far, this doesn't really seem connected, but writing notes as we go through the article is going to help us understand what the connection is between this article and the problem that we're trying to solve. So to take notes, if you're using the online version, you just highlight stuff and then you can add a note. So I, before I do that though, I'm just gonna highlight Oregon, Hawaii, and Japan. And, oops, I'm gonna highlight it, but I'm also going to leave a note. So my note is just gonna say how not just how, but to think more deeply. I'm going to, to try to say, I wonder how the shoes got to these three different locations. So if you have your article on paper and you wanna write a question like that while I'm typing, or if you want to write it by hand if you have the packet. Okay, so how, how did these shoes get to these locations? And I'm adding exclamation points because I really want to know the answer to this question. It's baffling. Okay, so I'll save that and you'll see there's this little icon over here and if you click on it, you can see your notes. If you're, if you're using a paper copy of this, it doesn't matter that it does those fancy tricks online. The same notes, the same kind of annotations work just fine. Okay, so what we're going to do right now for this section of the video is I'm going to keep reading the article in the next part of the video. So if you want to just hang out with me on this video and read with me, that's totally fine. If you have a paper copy and or an online copy and you still want to follow along, that's okay. If you would rather read it on your own and not listen to me reading it, then you can, um, you can do that and then just come back and join us as soon as you're done. Okay, one last thing I wanna say is if you choose to not read it with me, absolutely fine, but I would really encourage you to find someone with whom you can read the article. If you have someone to talk to while you're reading it, it will help you notice some things because you will for, sort of force yourself to think more deeply. Like how when I saw that first thing about the three locations, my mind just thought how, but I had to put into words so that I could explain it to you what I was thinking. And so by doing that, it actually made my mind think a little bit more deeply about the topic. So I would encourage you to do that. All right, we're ready for part two of this lesson. This is lesson four, lesson four of sixth grade ocean, atmosphere, and climate unit. And we're going to be reading an article about how the ocean is in motion. So to be the most successful, there's a couple of things you're going to need for part two of this lesson, which is that 
if you can get a copy of the article to write notes in as we go, that's great. If you don't have a copy, not a problem. I'm going to read it and you can watch it on the screen. And anytime you want to take a note, just jot it down on a piece of paper. So that's something else you're going to need, something to write with, to write on. And then having another person to talk to you while you're doing this lesson is going to help you be the most successful that you can be. All right, I'm going to show you how to find this article. You can go to your Amplify Science account and then right here at the top, right here in the main menu, open that. And then you're going to scroll down until you get to library, which looks like this. Okay, so I'm going to go down their alphabetical order until we find it. We find it right here. And we are going to go to the one that's called the Ocean in Motion. So we just click over here until we find the article that we're looking for, which is right here. Now, if you would rather have a paper copy of that, let me show you how you can get access to that one. For a paper copy, you can get that from the Lesson 4 packet. So if you go to seattleschools.org slash academics slash curriculum slash science, then you can scroll down the screen until you get to middle school and then open up the Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate Unit Packet 4. And, or it will say Packet for Lesson 4. Once you get to that, you can just open it up and you'll have a paper version of it. And again, if you're just following along with me, we can do this together. You don't even need to have a different version of the article. You should be able to read it on the screen just fine. So the title of this article is The Ocean in Motion. There's a picture here and the caption of the picture says, thousands of shoes fell off the ship that was carrying them across the ocean. Eventually, some of those shoes washed up on this beach. People collected them and tried to find matched pairs. Surprising things sometimes wash up on shore, and this can happen all over the world. During a powerful storm in 1990, containers packed with 61,000 shoes fell off a cargo ship traveling across the Pacific Ocean and eventually washed up on beaches in Oregon, Hawaii, and Japan. These locations are hundreds or thousands of miles away from the place where the shoes were spilled. How did the shoes make their way to these locations. If you look at a photograph of Earth, most of what you see is the big blue ocean. After all, the ocean covers 71% of our planet. I'm going to pause for a moment because that's amazing. I'm going to just take a moment to highlight that because I think what a cool fact. Okay, let's begin again. In a photograph or on a map, it may not look like the ocean moves very much, but the opposite is actually true. The water in the ocean is always moving from place to place, carrying objects and organisms wherever it goes. So the shoes are getting carried around in the ocean, but I think it's interesting about the organisms because when I think of fish, whales, and other types of things that live in the ocean, I think they kind of carry themselves around. But there are organisms like little floating things like plankton that do actually get carried by the ocean. They, they can't really move very much by themselves. So that's interesting to think about. Okay, ocean water doesn't move randomly. It flows in consistent patterns. That feels to me like the kind of of information that Kitty Parada was hoping we would get from this article when we, when we were reading it. And I think it helps us understand what the title, The Ocean in Motion, is kind of telling us. So let's take a moment to write a note. So I will start by highlighting and then adding a note. And you can just write this on your paper if you want to. Let me move my picture. And I think I want to write a question here because I wonder what causes the ocean to move and why does it follow patterns? So the questions I wrote are, what causes the ocean to move? Why does it follow patterns? Just really curious about these questions. Okay, so let's kind of keep reading. I'm gonna save that note. Scientists call ocean water flowing in a continuous path an ocean current. Hey, that's a new vocab word. If you're on the computer, you can check this out too, but I can click on where it says ocean current and it gives me the de definition. That's clever. 
ocean water flowing in a continuous path. Currents carry all kinds of objects and organisms all over the world. The shoes made their way across the ocean with the help of ocean currents. Oh, cool. There's a map here. Let's take a look at this. Oh, um, you can see Australia here. You can see that there's a lot of ocean because remember 71% of our planet is covered with water. That is New Zealand. And the, the Maori people who live in New Zealand, they're the original people that have lived there for hundreds of years. They have a, a name for the country of New Zealand called Aotearoa, which means land of the long white cloud. And if you look there at it, you can see why they might have named it that. That's cool. Let's keep going. Okay, the ocean covers 71% of Earth and it is in constant motion. Two facts, that's cool. The movement of the ocean carries energy and objects wherever it goes. Okay, so that's important because we already read about how it's carrying objects. And now in the caption, it mentions the word energy. So I'm going to highlight that carries energy. And that's something that I'm looking forward to learning more about. So let's keep reading. Okay. In addition to objects and organisms, ocean currents carry energy from the sun all around the earth. Okay, so I have a couple questions. I'm gonna just go ahead and highlight that. Now, here's what I'm wondering. How does the ocean get energy from the sun? So from what I'm hearing from the article, it says ocean currents carry energy from the sun. So the ocean current, is that on the surface and it's absorbing the energy from the sun? Is it deep underneath the surface and it's somehow getting energy from the surface? Like, how does the current get energy? So I'm going to ask that question to, to do some, a little bit more research so that when I find an answer, I might recognize it. Okay, I wrote my question. It was just under my picture, but how does the ocean current, oh, that's supposed to say get, get energy from the sun. So interesting. Very interesting. Okay, let's keep reading. Okay. In fact, the motion of water around Earth's ocean is one of the main ways energy moves around the planet. That's cool. Energy from the sun is transferred to the ocean's surface. So you can see those are some underlined and blue dots words. We already know the word transfer means to move energy or objects from one location to another. But the word surface is the outside or top layer of something. We talked about the atmosphere being the layer of gas that surrounds a planet. Well, the surface is the top layer, in this case, the surface of the Earth. It's the top layer of the Earth, the planet itself. And then the atmosphere is right above that. Okay. As the currents move across Earth's surface, the energy moves with them. I do think this is important where it talks about Earth's ocean is one of the main ways energy moves around the planet. I think that's an important thing to make a note of. So I am going to um, just highlight that. And then what kind of question could I ask? I wonder what are the other ways besides the ocean? Like how else does energy move around Earth's, around Earth? So I think I'll ask that question. I think it's a good idea to dot, jot down any questions you're thinking at this point. If I had to maybe wonder or make a guess about other ways that energy moves around, I might think of earthquakes. Those seem like they have a lot of energy. Volcanoes, that's a lot of energy. I might think of plate tectonics, if you're familiar with that. Um, I might think about weather, like rain and thunderstorms. Those seem like they have a lot of energy. There's probably others that you can think of. So that's some interesting things to think about. Okay, all right, let's keep going. Energy from the sun is transferred to the ocean surface. As the currents move around Earth's surface, the energy moves with them. Okay, that seems important. So the energy comes from the sun to the surface of the earth, including a liquid surface of the ocean. And as the currents move, they take that energy from the sun with them. Okay, I feel like that might kind of help me understand a little bit 
about what I was asking in this question, which is how does the ocean current get energy from the sun? So with additional information, I might add a little bit more to my note. I might add this. So I added energy from the sun is transferred to the ocean's surface. And as the currents move across Earth's surface, the energy moves with them. Okay, so let's just close that note and let's keep reading. Okay, let's look at this map a little bit more. So it has Australia, um, New Zealand, the equator. We have the Pacific Ocean labeled as North Pacific and South Pacific. And there is an orange arrow that's pointing, I guess, north. If this is the North Pacific Ocean and this is the equator, so there's an orange arrow. And I can see from the key that it says warm current, orange arrow. So when I look at the whole map, I see orange here and I think, oh, that must be a warm current. Okay. Now, the caption is going to help us out. It says, a warm current moves moving north from the equator keeps Japan warmer than other places at the same latitude. Oh, that's interesting. The current shown on the map above is moving away from the equator. At the equator, a large amount of energy is transferred from the sun to the ocean's surface. As the current moves north, it carries this energy with it. If you place your finger on the map anywhere where this current moves, the water there would be warmer than you would expect for a location at this latitude because of the current that moves through the area. I love this statement. As the current moves north, it carries the energy with it. I think we should highlight that. That's cool. So these are the two statements that I highlighted. I think they're probably the most important. As I was reading it, that was the idea that I had. So as the current moves north, it carries energy with it. It's big stuff. Okay. Oh, there's another picture. Oh, interesting. Look, this picture shows a blue arrow. So looking carefully at the key, I can see that the blue arrow represents a cool current. Okay. So a cold current traveling north from Antarctica keeps the western coast of Australia cooler than other locations at the same latitude. Oh, so that's just kind of the opposite of what we saw in the previous picture of the ocean current off the coast of Japan. Okay, the current shown on the map above is moving away from the South Pole. The further away from the equator you are, the less energy is transferred from the sun to the ocean surface. That's what we learned in lesson two. With the least amount of energy transferred at the poles. This means the current traveling from the South Pole carries less energy with it than currents coming from the equator. If the ocean water weren't moving, then ocean surface temperatures in different locations would only depend on their latitudes. So if the whole ocean was frozen water instead of liquid water and it couldn't move, then it wouldn't be able to take that energy with it. But because ocean currents move, as they move, they take energy with them as they go. However, in locations where a cold current moves past, the ocean surface temperature is lower than you would expect. I really think we should add some notes here. The two paragraphs that we just read have talked about how energy can move from one location on the planet to another by moving through ocean currents. That seems important. I think you should write either a question or a comment. So pause the video so you can have enough time to really think about what you might want to say. If you're doing the lesson with someone, then you can share your ideas with each other. And then come back and join me and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that a student could write in this part of the paragraph. Okay, do you have some questions? Do you have some new notes? Do you have some ideas? I wish we were together so that I could hear some of your ideas. In the past, I've had students tell me that this sentence here is really important, so I highlighted it. Currents traveling from the South Pole carry less energy with it than currents coming from the equator. So I added, I added two notes. One is a question. I wondered, the question that I wondered is what kind of energy are currents carrying? And then the second thing I wrote just as kind of a summary is ocean currents coming from the equator carry more energy than ocean currents coming from the poles. I feel like that's the thing that I've learned from these two maps and the paragraphs that were explaining them.
Okay. The maps above make it look like ocean currents are constant. However, ocean currents can sometimes change direction. Oh, that's cool. Since ocean currents carry, carry energy around Earth, a change in the direction a current moves can change ocean surface temperatures at any locations the currents pass on its journey. In many parts of the ocean, surface currents come together to form gyres. Ooh, vocab word! Huge areas of water moving in big circles. So the definition of a gyre is a giant pattern of moving water that spans whole oceans and moves water from place to place in a circle. Okay, all right. Cool. Altogether, these gyres move water in a predictable pattern all over the globe, carrying energy, organisms, and other objects with them. That's how shoes were spilled in the middle of the ocean can end up in Oregon, Hawaii, and Japan. I think this kind of answers that question we had at the beginning about why do ocean currents move the way that they do? It sounds like they're part of a gyre, but I still wonder, like, why does the gyre form in a circle? What causes it to do that? So there's a little bit more investigation that we're going to need to do in order to understand this. Okay, so here is... Whoa, this is a super complicated map, but it does have a lot of lines. Some are red, some are blue. The key, which is right down here, you can kind of see it there, shows warm current, red, cool current, blue. Okay, ocean currents form five main gyres or circles. The Indian Ocean Gyre, the North Pacific Gyre, the South Pacific Gyre, and the North Atlantic Gyre and the South Atlantic Gyre. So if I look here, I'm looking for a circular path, and I see one here really clearly. It looks like sometimes as it moves through this gyre, sometimes the arrows are blue and sometimes they're red. I think that depends on where they're coming from. So this one's red, it's a warm current, it must be coming from the equator. And this, now the water current has turned blue, which means it's moving up from the pole. So we can see that gyre forming. Okay, I feel like this article had a lot of information. I'm really glad that Katie Parada sent it to us so that we could use this to help us understand more about how the oceans move energy all around the planet. Scientists, we are almost done with lesson four. This is lesson four, part three, collecting evidence using our digital model. The things you'll need for this lesson are a map of oceans and continents. You can either draw this or use the page from the lesson for a packet. You need something to write on, something to write with, and you need another person to talk to. During lesson four, we have learned two new vocabulary words. We learned the word ocean current, which is ocean water flowing in a continuous path. And we also learned the word gyre, which means a giant pattern of moving water that spans whole oceans and moves water from place to place in a circle. If you look at this picture, you can see that there are ocean currents that form these gyres. It's pretty spectacular stuff. Okay, so here's what we're going to do with what we've learned. We are going to be tracking currents in the sim. Using our digital model, we'll observe currents and gyres, and then we'll draw the path of the currents that we track. So this is a picture that's from the sim, and you can draw a similar picture in your notes, or you can use the packet for lesson four. This is how you get onto the Amplify Science sim. You go to your account, click on the menu, scroll down till you see oceans, atmosphere, and climate, and you click there and open it up. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. What I'd like for you to do is open the oceans, atmosphere, and climate sim and select current map mode. Be sure none is selected in the temperature. I know it's a lot of fun to have the temperature picture with all the colors, but we just want none. We just want to see the currents. And then find a current that could be part of a gyre. Remember, we're looking for a gyre that's a circular path. And then tap anywhere on the current to activate a tracking system that observes the path of the current. That's pretty cool. This is the link one more time. If you'd like to get a lesson four packet, it has a picture of this map. 
When you're done in the sim, there are three questions that I'd like for you to answer, and we'll come back and sort of go over those together. But let's get into the sim. So go ahead and click here and let's get started. Okay, I've opened the sim. You'll notice that I have it on map mode. You can see that in the over here in the modes. This is the current map. That's what we want. And then the temperature view is selected as none so that we can just see the ocean. I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And then all of these cool little lines appear. And what I do is I just go ahead and click anywhere for something that I think might be part of a gyre and I can watch where the water goes. It also tells me what temperature it is. That's pretty cool. So I clicked here and this one's moved all the way over there. And if I want to, I can come up here to speed it up. I want for you to spend at least 10 minutes exploring the sim. I'm just going to explore it for a little bit of time. So that one just kind of went down here and then fell off the map. So let's click on another one. I, I can kind of see that there seems to be a gyre sort of here, but this one is moving over and then it's like getting closer and closer to continent A, and then it slides down the continent. It doesn't, oh, now it's going to kind of start to come back. Maybe? Nope, it's going back to the pole. Let's try a little bit higher. Let's click on this one. Okay, it's moving around. So I've just clicked on this circle and it started to move this way and now it's moving that way and now it's, yeah, definitely forming a gyre. We have success. Okay. There are lots of other places on the map that you can explore. In fact, you can actually click on the map and drag it. How cool is that? So if something seems like it's going to go off the page and you want to get some more like a better look at it, go for it. And then we come back and we can see that where we clicked, it's still roaming around in that gyre. It's a beautiful gyre. I really want to encourage you to explore the sim some more on your own. But for this video, we're going to move on to the final part of today's lesson, which is taking what we've learned from the article and from our sim exploration and coming up with a few conclusions. So the three questions that I'd like for you to answer are one, describe the shape of the path of the current you tracked. Is it a circle? Is it an S shape? And I did at least two or three in my video of the sim and I could describe all of those or I could just describe the one at the end. And then it says, draw a star on the image to indicate the place where you think the current had the most energy. So for number one, where it says describe the path, you could just draw it. It might be easier than trying to describe it as a circle. So show where it is and then put a star where you think it had the most energy. Why did the current have the most energy in this location? Why are you saying that? What evidence supports your idea? And then the final question I want you to answer is, thinking back to the shoe spill in the ocean in motion, how might those shoes have traveled from the middle of the Pacific Ocean to Oregon, Hawaii, and Japan. At the end of lesson three, air temperature around the world, I posed this final question. I said, why is the ocean near Christchurch a different temperature than we'd expect for its latitude? I think we could answer this question now. Now we understand that the temperature of the ocean has a lot to do with how ocean currents move around our planet. Water with lots of energy at the equator moves away from the equator, taking the energy with it. Cold water near the poles moves away from the poles and takes that cold water with it on an ocean current. And that can dramatically affect the temperature of the ocean near Christchurch. So the next thing we need to try to figure out is how does the ocean temperature affect the air temperature of Christchurch and what might be happening differently during El Nino years to affect the air temperature of New Zealand? Okay, we'll explore some of those mysteries during lesson five. See you next time.